Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module that's part of the catch-up of the VITS RHI Advanced HIV and TB training. This particular module will be on abdominal HIV cases, part two. Just thank you to VITS RHI and Dr. Dave Stead for the content of these cases and PEPFAR for our funding. The third case in our case series is a 40-year-old female patient who's 24 weeks pregnant she has HIV positive and she's got a CD4 count of 98. She has a history of recently becoming jaundiced. And she was started on ARVs four weeks ago. The nurse at the clinic has very helpfully done an ALT um, and the ALT result is 120. She's now referred to, her to your doctor and you now have to decide what you're going to do about this ALT. The patient is otherwise relatively well. So looking at this ALT, we have to ask ourselves, what does it imply? And what is our differential diagnosis? So what is our differential for a patient who has an ALT of 120 and is otherwise still relatively well? We're first going to think about infective causes. And of course, the most common is going to be your actual viral infections of the liver. So your hepatitis viruses in our Eastern Cape setting, specifically A and B, in your larger centers, we are starting to see hepatitis C as well, E only in isolated case series. But of course, there's a whole range of viruses that could affect the liver, uh, CMV, epstein barr virus, herpes, herpes simplex virus, um, but all of those will only be in your patients who are severely immunocompromised. We can have your mycobacterial um, in, like a infiltration of the liver can also make the ALT go up. But interestingly enough, in your mycobacterium tuberculosis, not so commonly, you would normally see a cholestatic picture as it tends to be an infiltration from the outside in, and similarly with MAC. So usually in those patients, what you would see is that the ALP phosphatase and the gamma GT is already very, very high, and now the ALT is starting to creep up. There's also in your very low CD4 counts, scriptococcal, histoplasmosis, um, and hemoncia, some of your other more rare fungal infections as well as leptospiriosis, and of course, sepsis in itself can make the ALT go up. In our areas with malaria, an important um, to consider. And the other possibility, of course, is that any of these infections mentioned might be an underlying infection that is now irising once the patient is on ARVs. The exception would be your TB iris. And again, your TB iris tends to give much more of a cholestatic picture or an obstructive picture rather than an hepatocellular picture, and the ALT will be affected very late. So let's just continue our differential for an ALT120, and I'm going to look a little bit wider than just the patient we're currently discussing. And of course, the next thing we want to worry about is a possible drug reaction. So does she have a drug in these liver injury? This particular patient is only on ARVs. But there's this very specific drugs that we, we need to keep in mind. And for an hepaticellular picture, of course, our, our biggest worries are usually the TB drugs, especially your PZA, um, and to a lesser extent, your INH and your rifampicin. Of your ARVs, our NNRTI, so in our patient, efavirenz could be the cause of a DILI, and your protease inhib inhibitors to a lesser extent. And don't forget, um, good old-fashioned fluconazole, that a patient might be on for cryptococcal meningitis. Sometimes you'll have patients who has an hepatocellular picture, so the ALT is going up, but they're also systemically quite sick or they have cutaneous lesions. And avirapine there is for the first one we would consider. If you have a patient with a rash who is unwell, you would always check your liver functions. Um, but cotrimoxacil can also do that. And of course, if you have an abacavir hypersensitivity, you might have a rash with hepatocellular symptoms. There's not too many drugs that causes a cholestatic picture. Noted, notable there is your cotrimoxazole, luckily quite uncommon. Um, that could be very tricky to differentiate, for example, from a TB iris. And in the old days, when we used D4T quite a lot, steatosis or a fatty liver would sometimes also give a confusing picture. In both your cholestatic and your fatty livers, again, the ALT going up will be a much later um, a later phenomenon, and they won't go as high as it will with your hepatocellular delis. We also have to remember that patients take a variety of either herbal or complementary medicines, or just good old-fashioned alcohol can also affect the liver and cause um, drug reactions. 
And then lastly, there are some um, specific biliary disease conditions. Again, the ALT will be late in going up, but it might be increased eventually. Um, an HIV cholangiopathy with an actual attack of the HIV virus on the biliary tract needs to be considered if all other causes has been excluded. So great, so we've got this lady in front of us. She's relatively well. The ALT is 120, so what do we do at this point? And because she is well and the ALT is still only three times the upper limit of normal, we have a little bit of time to investigate it and get a bit of a better diagnosis. And of course, the first thing we would want to do is a full liver function test, specifically to look at your bilirubins and to get an idea of your hepatocellular versus your, um, obst your obstructive um, enzymes. You will also want to check for your hepatitis, hepatitis A and B and C if appropriate, and if in the right area, you would want to screen for malaria. So let us look at her LFT result to give us a better um, impression of what is happening. So we can see the ALT there is 450, and their hepatitis B studies confirm for us a chronic hepatitis B infection. You can see the hepatitis B core IgM is negative, so we know the infection was not recent, but we can see that she's still within that stage one or two of hepatitis B, where she's got both the serum antigen positive, indicating chronic disease, but also the hepatitis B E antigen is positive, which indicates a very high hepatitis B um, viral load. And that's a big concern from an infective bit, infectivity point of view. So from an assessment, we would say this is a chronic hepatitis B who's flared and probably due to an iris um, having started on ARVs in the last four weeks that might have contributed to that. In the back of our minds, it is also possible that she could have a dilly due to the efavirenz. But as we've confirmed the chronic hepatitis B, and we've also seen that that um, hepatitis B E is high, we will probably assume at the moment that's a chronic hepatitis B infection. The ALT is 450. She is not too ill. Um, if, the hepatite, if the ALT was very, very high, um, or the patient was very unwell, you would need to discuss with a consultant about how prudent it would be to consider continue with a drug like efavirenz in somebody who is um, taking strain um, in the liver. So a couple of quick points on that. What would be our preferred ARV regimen with hepatitis B co-infection? That's very easy. We're going to use the same regimen that she's been on all along. And we, although we expect that the tenofovir Amidristamine um, and efavirenz might have contributed to this irising at this point. We'd certainly want to, if possible, continue the ARVs as both the tenofovir and the FTC will also address the viral load of the hepatitis B. But we also need to think ahead because this lady is now 24 weeks pregnant and we need to make a plan on how to cover our baby for the hepatitis B infection um, during labor and delivery. And it's very important to plan this already while she is pregnant and to make sure that you have the right um, prophylaxis available when the baby um, will be born. So let's just go through the precautions we're going to take with a baby born to hepatitis B serum antigen positive mom. So very importantly, we want to be able to give this child hepatitis B immunoglobulin, especially as the hepatitis E um, antigen is positive. And you will combine this by also giving the first dose of the hepatitis B vaccine. It will give them at different sites. And you want to make sure the child's actually going to complete the four dose vaccination schedule of the hepatitis B vaccine. If the mom is HIV e antigen positive, um, like this mom is, then you would repeat your hepatitis B immunoglobulin. You'll give another dose of that in a month's time. You want to test your baby for hepatitis B serum antigen at six months to see if the baby has been infected. And you're going to give your usual post-exposure prophylaxis um, for HIV like you would do. So if the mammy's viral load was under 1,000, you would give nevirapine for six weeks. But let's make it a little bit more complicated and continue our story. So during labor, Mrs. NM has a first-degree tear which needs suturing. So it's our same patient. And whilst we are suturing, you pick yourself with the needle. So how would you classify your risk profile to contracting HIV and hepatitis B virus? And what post-exposure prophylaxis would you take? Which one of these do you think you are at a higher risk of acquiring? So the worrying um, statistic regarding the transmission after percutaneous exposure of a needle 
like a needle stick injury and HIV and hepatitis B is that hepatitis B is much more infective than HIV. So you can see the HIV rate there is as little as 0.1 to 0.3 percent. And what hepatitis B can have is 20 to 40 percent risk of exposure, and especially if they've got a very high hepatitis B viral load. And it's for this reason that it's so important that all healthcare workers must have had their full schedule of hepatitis B vaccinations. This guideline here is the HIV um, PEP guidelines that's been brought out by the South African HIV Clinician Society. They have a very nice complete guideline that is worthwhile reading. Um, a lot of the concepts out of this guideline is now being adopted in the EDL. Um, in the private sector, they are the preferred backbone is to give to Nofavir and FTC, um, and they combine it in the private sector with Voltagravir. We don't have that available in the public sector. So for post-exposure pro prophylaxis for HIV, we would usually use Nofavir and FTC, so Trivada, um, plus Lupinavir Ritonavir. If the patient can't tolerate the Lupinavir Ritonavir, either due to diarrhea or other side effects, you would use Atazanavir Ritonavir in those scenarios. You can see that efavirenz is a possible third drug, that, so that is the fixed dose combination of tenofovir, 3TC and efavirenz, but it's generally not recommended, mainly because efavirenz has got such a low genetic barrier in case you do convert, um, but also it's the one with some of the most side effects in that first six weeks. So let's just go through your options if you've got um, to be covered against hepatitis B exposure. And it depends on the healthcare worker who's had the needle prick. It depends on whether they've been vaccinated or not and whether we know whether the vaccination is taken. So if they've had a vaccination and we know that they've responded to the vaccination, so there's proof that they have a high level of hepatitis B serum antibodies, then there's no need for any intervention. If they've not vaccinated, that's the other extreme, you're going to obviously start their hepatitis B vaccination schedule on that day, an accelerated schedule, um, and you will give them the hepatitis B immunoglobulin um, at exposure and again a one month later. If you're not sure about the vaccination, you would do restart the course again. Um, but if they're vaccinated and you don't know, the antibodies have never been tested, then we can, one can give them a single booster of the HPV vaccine as well as a single booster of the hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Um, and you might have a patient who's had prior vaccination but has not responded and you would actually treat them like somebody who is not vaccinated um, at all. I've got a couple of slides on hepatitis B V infection, uh, just to give us a little reminder, acute hepatitis B V infection, smaller percentage of patients can get hepatitis B and can completely recover from it. And then it's similar to other um, viral infections that we know, such as measles, where you will have a peak of the hepatitis B serum antigen and E antigen during, during the infectious phase, then the body builds up antibodies, and you will have antibodies then both against the anti-HBC anti-HBS and anti-HBE, and that patient is immune and cannot be infected um, by H hepatitis B and will not have any long-term sequelae. But our concern is chronic hepatitis B virus infection, which is the majority of patients who do contract hepatitis B. And of course, our patients with HIV, there's a much higher chance of it becoming chronic. Um, and the most common feature of patients with chronic hepatitis B, inf B infection is that they have a continued presence of hepatitis B serum antigen, um, and you can actually measure the viral load of the hepatitis B, and they're running at high levels of hepatitis B viral load. Patients with chronic hepatitis B infection does not necessarily have an increased ALT, and it might be asymptomatic for periods of time. This is a nice little slide that shows the different phases of hepatitis, chronic hepatitis B infection. Um, and what I want you to notice there is that initially in the first um, part, first phase one and two of the infection, is that you still have a hepatitis B E antigen present, and that is usually associated with a very high level of hepatitis B um, DNA or a high level of viral load. But eventually there will be anti-hepatitis B E, um, which means you're in the chronic later phase of that illness. The last case is just a little interesting, a uh, couple of interesting slides, histology slides on a young lady who was HIV positive, had a CD4 count of two, 
Ayurveda Eve, and is claiming very sick fever, severe wasting, diarrhea for one month. And this is a patient where they went through that whole process as we outlined with the gastroenteritis. So the patient was given, um, was first worked up, stools were taken, very, several stool cultures all came back negative. The patient continued to be ill and was sent for a duodenal biopsy. And here you can see the h &E stain of that duodenal biopsy. And more interesting is the ZN stain. And I'm going to give you a little close-up of that. And you will see there are vast and vast amounts of, of acid phosphobacilli. And this was actually a diagnosis of mycobacterium avium complex um, of the gastrointestinal tract, which we sometimes see in patients with CD4s under 50 and can make them very sick. Thank you. To complete this session, please make sure you have also watched part one.